Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for March 29, 2019. I am your host, Scott Alden, and I'm joined by my lovely co-hosts, Steph Hodge. How you doing, Steph? Oh, I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Lincoln Damerst. Hey, everyone. W. Eric Martin. Are you feeling better? Hey. He's I'm alive. Okay. <laughs> this, this show is brought to us by Moving On Movers. <laughs> and first timer, Derek Porter. Welcome to the show. Hello, Yay, hello. Derek. Thanks hey, for having Derek. me. Yay. Awesome. Woo. So we've been really busy. We all just got back from the Gamma Trade Show. And prior to that, the Festival International de Joux in Cannes, France. And we have literally posted hundreds and hundreds. I'm not exaggerating. Of videos <laughs> of game demonstrations. There is uh, a lot. Including Nuremberg, too. There is a lot. Derek has been editing furiously. Lincoln. Er, uh, Eric's been uploading. Steph's been putting in her uh, two cents. And... We're really happy to have that new Board Game Geek Express channel, and if you want to subscribe to it, it's right there. Bing! <laughs> so hopefully that's the right spot. Uh, I don't know if that's where it will really come in, but, you know, YouTube. Um, cool. So, uh, so it's been an exciting month for us here at Board Game Geek. We just put the tickets on sale for BGGCon 2019 at the new venue in downtown Dallas Woo! at the Hyatt Regency. Uh, what's that coin called? Reunion Tower, or Reunion. Reunion, yeah. So um, I'm hoping no one shows up to the wrong hotel this year. That would be really unfortunate. <laughs> but anyway, so those tickets are on sale. Uh, they're going quick. We have probably 100 left, I think, at this by this time. Um, wow. On Friday, the way they're going. So if you want to come, please get a ticket. Uh, hotel rooms are going on sale as we speak. So you're probably furiously trying to get through that hotel right now. Anyway. That is the BGGCon 2019. Um, also, we are announcing, which we announced prior, but the Tabletop Network uh, 2019 is um, in the beginning of that show. So basically, the Sunday night through the Tuesday night, you can attend the Tabletop Network conference. If you are a designer or producer or developer of games, not publishers, unfortunately, um, check that out. We have a The lineup is amazing. It's like... Uh, Alan Moon, Rob Davio, Matt Leacock, Martin uh, Wallace, Elizabeth Hargrave, um, so many people. It's really ridiculous, um, the amount of talent going there. And you can hang out and talk to them. And there's panels all day and workshops. And it's going to be an amazing thing. So join us for that before BGGCon. And the tickets are available on BGG's website under the Events tab. Cool. Today I noticed that uh, for BGG Spring, there's a virtual flea market on the Geek, so I'm all in on that. <laughs> I always need more games, so <laughs> if you're going to oh, BGG Spring... Oh, I thought Spring, you were trying to get rid of stuff, so there you go. I, got I, I always want games. Right. Like, you gotta cycle them. <laughs> more games, more Sorry. games! You need to play them all. It's hard to play them all if you don't have them all. <laughs> well, you, got, you gotta know someone. I know you know some people have games, so that's you're, you're doing pretty good there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of people who've been around for um, a while in this uh, board game hobby and collecting that they it's time to move some stuff out because you know look at look at all this stuff. It's hard to keep track of it all. <laughs> well, if you're not if you're not careful, then you end up with more games than you could ever play in your lifetime. Too late. I'm probably past that point. I don't remember <laughs> the last time I took a game off this shelf. I'm only working on what I just have downstairs in boxes, and it's like mm, maybe I should get rid of some of these. Anyway, I love all of them, so it's really hard. Lincoln has actually helped me trim Many it back times. and uh, probably need to do it again. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be there in May doing it again. And we get, it's, uh, I have to come early. I have to come early as usual. And I guess I can do it now. Well, a few of us have had to move recently. So we had to do that whole, do I really need to pack this game up in a box and take it with me? <laughs> the answer is yes. No, it is not. <laughs> I, I bought the smallest pod when I moved. So I had to make hard decisions of like, all right, I can only fit 20 boxes full of board games when those 20 boxes oh. are full. <laughs> wow. How many How many games is 20 boxes? Like 300? Well, it, I don't know. It's so hard to count because they're all weird sizes. And I'm also one of those weird people that, like, sometimes when a, a game outgrows its box with expansions, I put it in, like, a Plano box or a toolkit or something, you know, so. Creative packaging. <laughs> yeah, like, like my zombie side stuff is in one of these big heavy-duty tool tool chess <laughs> you know? yeah i know what you're talking about i've been there um 
as Steph mentioned, that's the virtual flea market. Check for that on the geek list. We're also going to have the spring cleaning uh, sale flea market as well, right? Mm. Right. We have um, set aside hundreds of games ready for the spring flea market, um, and that will be for charity. Cafe Momentum, check it out. It's a great charity. They have some great videos now uh, that weren't there last year, so um, you can get a really good feel of the of the charity that we support through the sales of our older games that are in storage, and we just don't use them anymore, so it'd be great. it's a great cause, and hopefully you'll get some good gems. I know there's good games in that. I got some I, amazing I, I, games last year. Last year yeah. was awesome. <laughs> I took home more games than I should have. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Another big thing happening on Board Game Geek is the 13th Annual Golden Geek Awards for games released in 2018. So all the nominations are in. The top 10 or 12 uh, finalists have been picked. We need your help to vote for those winners. Basically go to the front page of Board Game Geek, click on the Golden Geek Award announcement, click on over to the awards section, and pick and rank your games for each category we have. Um, we really appreciate your participation in this i think the golden geek awards is the only people's choice award out of all of the awards in the industry um and so i'm pretty proud of what um the site has come up with the games this year and thanks for voting we really appreciate it okay moving on to board game news one of the games that we saw at the game festival in con was namiji from Fun Forge and Antoine Bauza. And it's interesting to see the announcement of that because as i was doing the demo at the show it's very much like, yes, this is, this is Tokaido, but with new things. And it was kind of interesting just to see how games are reintroduced to the marketplace where they're the same but different. And of course, this is not new. This has been going on forever, where we had Catan and then all sorts of versions of Catan and spinoffs of Carcassonne and Ticket to Ride and all this. But it seems like a bit more of a, a modern twist, I guess, where... Most of the game system is the same, but in Takedo, everyone goes along a path. Whoever is farthest back in the path takes the next turn, and you land on a space, and you do stuff, and you try to collect things, and you get points in all these various ways. And in Namiji, this is what you're doing on a path. The person at the last goes, and they get points, and they do something, and they do different things, but it's the same. And it's the same but different. And it's weird just because... Uh, Schmidt Spiele and Wolfgang Warsch this year released Doppelt So Clever, which is the same as Ganz schon Clever, Ganz schon Clever, but just with different scoring methods. And it's, it's interesting to see games that are so similar and yet meant to be standalone, as opposed to something like Dominion, where everything just gets mixed together if you want to play that way. I don't know, it just seemed like a way to put new titles on the market with a very crowded market, and you're going to sell something that's new and familiar and at the same time. It's this weird mix of trying to hit everything, just like companies are coming back with new editions of older games, where we had Suburbia Kickstarter recently, there's uh, Exodus has a new version that's on Kickstarter, there's a new version as well of a game that is fleeing my mind at the moment woolly wars or whatever that was woolly wars yes from louis mem when i saw woolly wars i was like dang it i wanted that game back in the day and so now i have an opportunity to get it so it's funny i never bought it i don't know what happened what was the original name it had it, a different name woolly bully woolly bully woolly bully was the original and then the new game that's that's being redone is valley of the kings so oh, it's yeah. the same game, but now it'll have components for five or six players and solo rules and new pharaohs. So individual players get their own special, unique powers. So it's the same game, but different. It's reselling something on the market again, just because, you know, as, as Lincoln is saying, you had something that you're interested in. Oh, I passed it over. And you just, that game is always available. You could just go get it. But then this new title comes on the market and it's got the special you know, first player token or something <laughs> new. And you're finally like, okay, fine, I'll get it. And so publishers are coming out with things that way. Well, it's probably less expensive. Who knows? I mean, everything seems to be the $20 price point now for some of these small box games. So I'll probably do okay on it. Yeah, just a little pickup game. The hobby audience has grown so much too that a lot of these, like, like for example, I'm only in the hobby like six or seven years. And so some of these games from back in the day, I've never, I've never seen them. Absolutely. That's right. The hobby market has expanded a lot, so these new additions take familiar gameplay, like the new edition of Jaipur that's coming from Space Cowboys. If you didn't get it 10 years ago, you can 
get it again now. I think I just got my copy a year or two ago, so and I bought it new, so it's been available, I believe. <laughs> yeah, but now we'll, we'll revamp it. Yeah. But now it's it's part of the two player series, which is really cool because it's a whole bunch of similar kind of weight type of games, which sounds really cool. Well, we I know we've always kind of lamented that some of those older games aren't available, so it'll be interesting to see if they succeed in the market because people might think it's old and dated. Or are they just dated? That was going to be what I said. Right. Yeah, they're just dated. <laughs> dated mechanics, dated themes, dated art. Uh, but usually, I guess, most of the ones you've mentioned, Eric, are, are reinventing themselves with some new stuff and new artwork. and So it'll get us to buy them again for the second time. Yeah, Cleopatra's coming back where Cathala and Maublanc have revamped it all, you know, refreshed it. There's new pieces, there's new bits, and changed rules from 14 years ago or so. So it's interesting. Um, if there's new rules, I'm curious because I want to see what they did. Because I liked Cleopatra okay, but when I played it last year, it was dated. <laughs> so maybe if they updated it, I will appreciate it more. Yeah, it's hard to say that because, of course, you're, are you going to pay $60 to go see what those new rules are like? That's true. That's what cons are for, like BGG Con. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. We will have copies available. Well, the box is ginormous. I, we saw the pieces. It's just I know. I thought those were like two huge. times the size. It turns out they're actual size. It's going to be unbelievable. We need the giant Cleopatra, too. That's another thing. The box sizes of everything has just get, been getting so huge. Like, I just got a game the other day that's twice as big as really what it needs to be. The box is, is What is game massive, was that? So. Clash of Rage. Wow. It massive, like a big huge box. Kickstarter <laughs> box. It's huge. And it's got an expansion, which is a shoe box. So... Does it fit inside the original box? I don't. I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> I haven't tried to put it together yet. One of the other big new titles that we saw at the fairs, or one of the fairs, Gamma in particular, is Die Hard, the Nakatomi Heist game. Uh, we filmed an overview that we will publish in late April when the embargo ends. And it's the Die Hard movie made into a game. Essentially, one person is John McClane, everyone else is playing terrorist. And the terrorists are trying to achieve certain goals before John McClane can stop them. And you go through a three-act structure where the board enlarges over the course of the game. You got Act 1, and then you unfold it for Act 2, and you unfold it again for Act 3, and you run through the entire movie. And it's kind of like, what other properties from the 80s are left to be made into games at this point? Because it seems like everything is. I don't know... What I'm missing here that, that possibly can make it, but Breakfast Club, Breakfast Club, okay, Sixteen sure. Candles, Home Alone. Oh wait, oh yeah, that was a bad game. Yeah, I know that it's it's had a game before, but I I, I want to do Willow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Willow, Willow. Wasn't there a new Willow recently? I know the the company that did Jim Henson's Labyrinth. Uh, Dark Horse, uh, I believe. I thought uh, they had a Willow version coming out. Oh wow. Oh, so Derek, hmm. your dream has come true immediately. Yes. <laughs> no, I was trying to think. Oh, yeah, what are some other '80s? Um, I don't know what it would look like, but I, I would be amused at an attempt at a board game based on the UHF movie, Weird Al Yankovic's movie from the. That from would the be funny. 80s. Yeah. Well, the that's networks. the networks, I believe. <laughs> or, or, or yeah, that's it. They go like like a UHF themed expansion for the networks. There you go. Yes. Yeah, one of the channels is called U sixty two anyway, so. The initial the initial shows you have are so UHF. It's fantastic. <laughs> All right, so we're moving on to uh, everybody's favorite segment. What have you been playing, uh, Steph? Why don't you kick us off? Oh man, it's been a month for campaign games and legacy games, and I have been playing Aeon's End Legacy nonstop. Like I am all in. I've never played Aeon's End, so I cannot compare the games at all. Um, I suppose that they probably play similar. It is a deck building game uh, for those who haven't played it. And you're never going to shuffle your deck, which is cool. So you're simply putting them in your discard pile and then flipping them over. So you can kind of like stack your deck if a little bit. (laughs) Um, But it's it's a legacy game. I think there's like seven chapters if you uh, that you can work through and it's awesome. I, I love it. And I'm not even really that into theme and fantasy, but I, I got to, I'm playing the um, Archer character and it took every bone in my body not to name him Legless because, <laughs> you know, Legless is the best. So <laughs> so I named him something 
I just made up. Armorless. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you get to name all your cool things. Like you have a cool character card. You name it. You name all. You write it down on the. Card. I like destroying things. So people who like legacy games, you know, would probably like this too. I was just going to ask, do you, do, you, do you tear cards up and remove stuff and put stickers on stuff and all that? You do sticker things and and you are banishing things from the game, but they, you know, I, you're not actually ripping anything up. But I am writing on a lot of things, so that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. The coolest concept of that, I, have, I haven't played Anne's in, but the coolest concept of it is that you're creating a mage, right? or some sort of character that can then be used in other Aeon Zen games as well. You're creating your own custom character and then you can bring it into the other other titles that exist. It's a very I cool know. idea. So once I'm done with this, I'll have to go get those those games because I, I, I want to use my, my character more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, it's a co-op game. So you're working with your, your other mage friends and you're beating the baddies and horrible things are happening and you're like no <laughs> so how much of your deck do you retain from game to game since it's a campaign deck building game um you don't retain any you, you keep your starting deck and then so without giving away too much you have your your nine cards like you would in like a normal deck building that you can buy during the gameplay at the end you might get more cards to choose from to replace but you have choices like you might have four choices but you can only choose two of those to add in and take away so you're 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 making your nine available buys different each time if you will interesting okay does the game proceed to the next story even if you fail um so once you get to a certain chapter i think it's like chapter three you if you fail you'll do it once more and i think you only repeat a thing once even if you fail the second time too but don't do that that's a little like Pandemic Legacy. I haven't played that. <laughs> I should probably play that. If you fail in a month, you just play I it imagine. again. Yeah. Now, if you fail twice, you play. You go on. You'll eventually get through so. it. <laughs> you eventually get through it. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I know in Pandemic they just they like here here's some extra action cards <laughs> since you're doing so bad. <laughs> yeah, since you suck so bad, we're gonna give you give you better. I think there was one one thing in Pandemic Legacy. Is it is it okay to talk? Well, about don't spoiler me because I might go back and play it. <laughs> no, there's no. There's not really a spoiler, but there's a pack of cards in the game that says "Open if you lose three times in a row" or something like that. It's just tissues. <laughs> oh yeah, it's tissues. It's a box of tissues. Mistake. We're so terrible. Well, Ian's end or Ian's legacy. Ian's end legacy. Yep. Sounds really great. We actually picked up the box last weekend in my game group. And we set it back down because we were like, oh. we really want to play some. We really wanted to play something else, which I will talk about in a minute. But yes, but you have to, I, Scott. I'm really sure you're gonna like. I'm it. I'm looking forward to it now that you like. Now knowing that you yeah. like it, I'm probably I'm sure I'm gonna like it. Yeah. So we played instead of Eons and Legacy. We played Big Trouble in Little China, the game, which is not the deck building game by Upper Deck. It is the board game with minis by. I'm excited about that one. Everything Epic Games, and it is. I can't even expl- express how awesome it is. It It's everything I ever wanted in a Big Trouble in Little China board game. It has <laughs> all of the characters. I, everything I didn't know that I wanted to play. It has all the characters. It has tons of special abilities. It has quests. It has choices in the game. So you make one choice or another choice. can affect the game. Um, and you're trying to just basically save your... Uh, it's Wang's fiance. Wang? Yeah. Mike's fiance gets stole, uh, kidnapped at the beginning of the movie or beginning of the game because she has green eyes and Lo Pan needs to uh, marry a, have a bride with green eyes so he become mortal again and that is what you're trying to stop and kill him before he can marry um, I forget her name but it's Wang's fiance that's what they call her just Wang's fiance I'm sure oh uh, Moi Moi yeah so uh, it is great we played a three player game. And the minis are really cool. I really want them painted now, Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll take them with me. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, it's super fabulous, and the powers are really cool. And you and you level up in the game, and it's it's like an Ameritrash dream. So check it out. Do you have to like the movie? Because I've never seen. I don't movies. think you need to like the movie. You don't need to know it. It's better if you do. But uh, there's lots of fun in the game. But besides the point, like you can basically. Jack Burton, the main character, um, 
you can design them how you want. Like, if you want to give them a submachine gun at the beginning of the game, you can. Or if you want to give them a knife or, or even some other kind of special abilities. And you can kind of, t- like, make it how you want, right? 80s, 80s um, theme we need to do. We an need 80s to do theme. Crocodile Dundee, man. There you go. <laughs> You call that a bold game? This is a bold game. <laughs> so Big Trouble in China uh, is sort of a underground movie, I guess. It wasn't really like a big hit, but it was before its time. It was like wire kung fu movie. So if you ever get a chance to see it, watch it. Um, I think it holds up. I haven't seen it in a I, while. I love that I've movie, it. man. Still we, watch We it all regularly. love it, but I'm not sure if... I don't know if Steph would like it. Like, I'm not sure. Right? Oh, I don't, well. No, you know, it's got well, it's got a little '80s one. kind of weirdness to it, and the soundtrack. Pacing. Yeah, it's cheesy, but uh, it's a cool movie and a cool game by Everything Epic, Chris Bartarlos. That's awesome, Eric. How about you? What have you been playing? Uh, I have not been playing too much since I'm mostly packing for a move. Uh, I did get a sample copy of Nagaraja from Hurricane. While we are in Khan, I've played it three times now. It's a two-player-only game where you're both archaeologists going into some sort of temple, trying to find treasures. And, of course, it's weird because you each have your own temple. So I don't know how you know what the other person's doing. Yeah, thematically, it's a little weird that way. But you have a three-by-three three grid, and on three sides of your grid, you are going to have three mysterious treasures because you shuffle all the treasures and put them face down around there you are going to use cards to bid for dice sticks that are going, you're going to roll to either get nagas, the snakes, that's the naga and the naga raja, or you're going to get bidding points. And whoever has more bidding points wins at the tile that you then get to put in your grid. And so you're slowly trying to build paths to reach these uh, little, you know, idols or trophies on the side and the first player to get 25 points wins. It's very straightforward, except three of the trophies are cursed and they're worth the most points. And if you reveal those three trophies, then you lose the game. And they are cards. You can spend cards for bidding power, or if you get Nagas, you can cast a spell with the card for the special powers, which then lets you do all sorts of various things, including manipulating the other player's board. So you can make them lose if you know where their tiles are. So you can look at various things and move stuff all around. And it's very simple, streamlined, quick playing, two-player game from Bruno Cathala and Teo Rivera. Yeah, I just re- I remember seeing that. And they had really cool, like, stick dice, like you say. I guess that's what they're called. They're really, yeah, like, really cool. Yeah, or rune dice so or however that- you want to wanna think of them. Yeah. It's very simple, straightforward. The insert... If you like box inserts, this box inserts will be the insert to end all inserts. It is majestic. I should take pictures just to Ooh. show this. I mean, if you are if you get excited about a good insert, this this game will have everything. I sent a new geek list for you to create. Yeah, it um, is. Is that game weird. available in the states now? It is mm, coming to the states, I believe, April or May. Distributed by Asmodee North America from Swiss publisher Hurricane. How about you, Lincoln? What have you been playing? We got to play Tiny Towns last weekend, which is the new game from Peter McPherson and AEG. Oh, I love that game. It is insane, okay? It's a tiny little grid that you are... So you have a, a, an array of buildings that you can build every round. Uh, you know, It changes every game, excuse me. And you build them by placing cubes on the board orthogonally, or, you know, it's they have to match a pattern. And the pain in the rear end is you place whatever anybody else picks. So if they pick glass, you must place glass. And you're all of a sudden stuck with these pieces that you don't necessarily need. And your board gets choked up and it's amazing because it is so hard, so hard. Um, We totally got thrashed and I saw it coming. I'm like looking at the board, I'm like, oh my God, Isaac's board is insane and he's gonna kill us and he totally and then I thought oh my gosh he's in trouble and then he brought it back it's so cool I think I got stuck with six pieces that I could not use uh and so my game was done way before everybody else's and then Rodney was pretty bad he he I think he did I think we all had roughly similar scores but oh my gosh, it was a pain in the rear. It's so fantastic. And what the deal is, the buildings that you build will uh, will benefit 
by having other buildings adjacent or whatever. And so you're hoping, like I had this big grand scheme that I was going to have all different buildings in these two cross sections for the tavern, I believe, is the one that needs it. And it just it went to heck so so fast it was over. I mean, it's, it's just great. Really, really neat design. And it's a bingo style play, so you could play with any number of people, really. Absolutely. Yeah, well, you, need you just gotta have enough components. Oh yeah, that, that game is ripe for streaming. It's, oh, I love yeah. that. <laughs> it's amazing. AEG is gonna do some streaming events. When the game is released in early April, they've, they've already talked about that. Oh, where, awesome. hey, you can all get copies and play along with so-and-so and do some big event. So when you're putting your pe- your cubes into the grid, you're trying to match a pattern, like let's say the, well, like a house, the, the, a village, the or cottage is, is, like is like three four, pieces. It's like four. Oh, okay, so it'll be like three pieces of cloth and one piece of glass, something like that. It's like wood. The, there's a formula, brick right? Like and glass. A That's yeah. a, and it's got to be. It, it can be mirrored or rotated, but it has to be in right. that orientation. And so, so I mean, it's a polyomino game. Yes, it, it literally is, but just with cubes that you make your polyominoes. But so it's, it's a little Tosh, Tosh Kalar, and um, in be, between two cities, because you're trying to get the cities, the pieces of the city next to each other, town. Well, you're trying to. Right? So once you build, right? once you, let's say you get those three pieces for your cottage, you can choose any one of those three positions that the cubes were in to place, but. It also needs adjacency rules for like the well in this case, the game that we played gives you bonus points. And um, I think Isaac was doing the the chapel or the the uh, chapel uh, bungle uh, cottage thing. And it was it was insane. He was he just had it in his head from the get go and he kept picking wheat. I can't believe he picked so many wheat. It's like, how could you need so many wheat? (laughs) It was insane. So when he calls the material, you have to place it in Absolutely. your city, right? So you might not need it. So you're trying to put you probably put your your garbage in the corners or something. Yeah. If you can, cool. you run out of space pretty quick. I, I right, had bring- one building that let me. If I built it, it would let me select three other buildings, three distinct buildings, so that when anybody else built that building, I got to just place it. And yeah. it was like because there's a you get two cards at the beginning of the game that are like secret secret buildings that you can build and so mine was huge it was like this giant and i got it built it was like the first one of the first things i built and then it was just all downhill from there because it took up all this space and then i started getting these other buildings that you know that i needed a place which was good i wanted those buildings but the one i need the one that i wanted was the factory which nobody built the factory is a really neat building because what it is is when you select a good on that building you put it in the peak of the building you put a cube on there and whenever whenever anybody anybody selects that cube you automatically get to pick any other cube you want and oh my gosh it would have saved my bacon if i'd had that darn thing now i i would have had to known to put wheat in there because it was either wheat or brick were the two things that i just was like stop picking these things although nikki saved my life when she picked brick one time it was it's amazing really good I know they released this at the Gamma Trade Show, but I think it was going straight to stores, uh, FLGS, where you could buy it for up to two weeks or something like that before it goes online. So Everybody wanted it when we played it. <laughs> uh, due out April 26th at retail. What have you been playing, Derek? All right. Uh, so I've been playing... Uh, I, I played my fourth game of Root uh, over this last weekend. And uh, I am... That's becoming probably my favorite game I'm playing right now. I'm I I know I've talked to a lot of people that have played a lot of it and they said that once you've kind of mastered the game the novelty kind of wears off and you know it's like it, it doesn't really carry as much it doesn't have as much luster as it might have well, had. Well, I'm rooting for you er, there Derek. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I got so I've I've pl- we barely played with the expansion. Um, no one picked any of the new factions in the Riverfolk expansion, but I did get to play my first game as the Vagabond, and I did play the Scoundrel uh, 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 Vagabond from the new expansion. That was the only element we used from the expansion in the game. But uh, the Vagabond is is right now my favorite my favorite uh, faction to play in Root. Um, you, just because I feel like you have you have a lot more manipulative control over the other players because you can decide who you're budding up with and who you're going to stab in the back. And I did get to experience, a lot of people talk about with Root that you don't get that, like the game just stops and there's no like epic conclusion. 
I did have an epic finale, though it was due to a dice roll. Um, but I basically, I ended up, I had betrayed one fact. I was in a three-player game. I had betrayed one faction and then used them to attack the other faction. And then the amount of warriors I eliminated in that attack was enough to push me to the victory. So it was like this ultimate Game of Thrones-style, like, cloak and dagger betrayal on both players. And I, and I pulled it, it, it. It's the best uh, finale to a Game of Root that I've ever had. <laughs> in, in four games? In four games, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, th- that is the challenge with Root that I have found is that it's not. It has a high barrier of entry. It's you can't just pull this thing off the shelf and start playing it. It's with new players. It's twenty five minutes minimum of teaching. You know, so um, that is the challenge. So it, it is the game. It's like it's it's very niche, and it is the game that I I, I have to play with the right kind of people that that, that are invested in it because it's. There's a lot of hurdles to get into the game. And I understand, I think that's probably why a lot of people get over it, because they get excited and exploring it and experimenting and understanding how the system works, and then when it kind of becomes too familiar, then they move on. But I'm not there yet. I'm still loving this game, so. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, the, that game is really interesting, and in that I think the Vagabond, you're one character, in the, you have one single figure piece, right? Yep. Whereas all the other factions are like multiple armies of characters, and all kinds of stuff like that, where you're just one dude running around the map doing stuff. How I've kind of built it to people is I've said that, yeah, the cats are kind of like, that's your standard resource management Euro game. The birds are a little more like programming. And then the, the vagabond though feels like that's the, that's the thematic like dungeon crawl role playing. You, you know, you have, you have a uh, quest objective cards that you need to complete. And, uh, and there's, errors on the board for you to explore to get more items and then your relationship with the other players is when they craft items you can then offer them cards to get those items and which gives you more uh action points essentially in a turn so um you know it's def- it definitely feels like it's like if, if you're a solo gamer then i guess the vagabond is the is the faction for you because you can pretty much function almost independently uh, in that game, unless they decide to start attacking you. But the game I played, no one really saw me as a threat until the very end. So, <laughs> who who would dare attack that cute vagabond? I mean, he's well, just, he's just the thing is, his is, own business. Oh yeah, the, the 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 fact is, I was a scoundrel, which is a little more sinister looking. Um, but the special ability is you have a torch action that every 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 different every different uh, vagabond has a different uh, ability they can have that involves basically spending your torch action, which is what you use to explore the dungeons or the ruins, excuse me, on the board. Uh, but this one is probably the meanest of all, and it's a, it's sort of like a one time nuke. Uh, it's called Scorched Earth, and it says, uh, "Place this torch in your clearing. Remove all enemy pieces there. Pieces can no longer be placed in or moved into this clearing." So I basically give up my torch uh, item to nuke a space on the board that nobody can ever use again. And I used it to disrupt the network of the Marquis de Cat faction, and it was quite satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, you're making me want to play this game again. Just by talking about that. I went through a little bit of what you went through, about four or five games, and I kind of just set it aside for a bit, but uh, maybe I'll get back into it. I, and I can see maybe after, because I, I still want to play every faction that's out there. I haven't played the Alliance yet. Um, but I, I've played the cats, I've played the birds, I've played the lizard folk in the new expansion, which were very weird. I want to try them again. I didn't, I didn't understand it <laughs> when I played it the first time. Uh, and then now I've played the Vagabond, and so far the Vagabond's the one I've enjoyed the most. Of course, it is the one time I've won the game, too. But <laughs> um, Might have something to do with College your impression. Maybe, maybe. But it, like I said, every other game of Root I've played, it is true. The game just can kind of stop. Somebody just all of a sudden, their points are at 30, and that's it. Uh, but this one yeah. had like a big epic conclusion that it was like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, what a, what, what a way to end the game, you know. There's another way to end the game, but it's sort of like a shortcut, right? Like it's an early end where yeah, someone has I, control. Yeah, I have of never areas. seen anybody Domination succeed. Yeah. yeah, the dominance cards where you can basically, uh, once you have at least ten points, you can't just do this from the get go. You can basically play a card, and they are special objectives to like hold certain points on the board. And then at the start of your turn, if you control whatever your card says you need to control you immediately win the game. So when you do that, basically you're giving all the other players a chance to try to stop you. Now, the, there, there was a player in this last game I played that did that, and I deliberately, because there was another player between me and that player, 
I didn't bother trying to stop him from winning because I knew that it's like, oh, I'm going to force the cat player to, instead of building all their stuff, they're going to have to send troops and use their actions to attack him to keep him from winning. So I kind of forced his hand to do that, which allowed me to sort of keep pushing my score up a bit. But I've never seen, I've yet to see anybody win with a dominance card. I'm sure it's possible, but it's like, it's, I haven't seen it happen yet. In the four games that I've played. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to Kickstarter news and call it a day. Uh, there's been a couple really interesting Kickstarter announcements. One I think Lincoln has been waiting for for like five years, or is it been, has it been five years? Three. Years. Uh, we did uh, Three. we did the game yeah. night in 2016, I believe it was, and um, we've definitely been waiting for it, and it's really successful. It's the new uh, the second edition of Carnival Zombie, and they've added a bunch of new elements to the game in miniatures. I know Scott, Scott backed it already. Um, I did, and we and he's got two copies of the game. I think we could probably see one of them in the background there. Is there one right here? Can you see that one? Oh, it's <laughs> a, it's just out of camera. Just no, I said. I, oh, I, I'm seeing it in the Skype call. Yeah, but yeah, it's an amazing game. Definitely one of the best co-op tower defense games yeah. ever made. Um, with an amazing theme. Uh, the city of Venice is actually a leviathan that has been lying in slumber for thousands of years and enough enough of the human sacrifices have been made to bring it back to life so the the city of venice can sink while you're trying to escape it and all of the undead were coming out of the out of the water um are all kind of themed to the carnival it's carnival right like right the, the celebration so um, it's the where everybody's uh, dressed comedia, up uh, com- comedia comedia arte yeah. type yeah, stu- yeah. Uh, characters um and it's fantastic. And I'm really happy that they brought it back because it seemed like almost a little distressing because they were like, oh, we're going to launch it soon. And, and that was what they said when we disappeared were at, for three at years. Essen 2015. Yeah. They're like, it'll be yeah, coming soon. I remember soon. seeing the banner. Yeah. Yep. Coming soon. Yeah. Plus, it has one of my favorite elements ever, which is the crypt uh, where you drop the zombie bodies. It is so fantastic. And I'll never forget Dave. It's just cubes, and you're dropping them in this pile of cubes, and any cubes that fall off the mat come back onto the board. And I remember Dave picking up three cubes and going over to the board and dropping them, and two of the cubes stuck to his fingers, and only one cube fell, and then the other two cubes fell off, I think. It, it was during the, uh, the episode. And then it's we something had... Like, I just rewatched the episode, by the way. I watched... That's a, I love that episode. I've, I've watched <laughs> that game, that episode, several times, which is kind of weird, right? Because you think, oh, how can it be different? But every year, I'll kind of come back to it and watch it. So, yes, Dave, <laughs> sticky fingers, Dave. Matthew as well. Shaky Matthew hands, shaky hand, Matthew. Hands. What shaky was Shaky hands and Matthew? sticky fingers. <laughs> yes. I'm like, Matthew, what's going on? Are you having a, a, a stroke or something here? <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, he was nervous or something. I don't yes. Know. Uh, as of this recording, they're at $241,000 with 2,200 backers. I bet they can probably do a lot more than that. They got a lot of room to grow there. So, um, yeah, check it out, Carnival Zombie. Um, I also noticed another... We I should have mentioned this earlier with the reprints... But everything old is new again. <laughs> Glenmore II, or Glenmore <laughs> Two. It says II. Some I don't know. People I mean, might I guess call it. Yes, Glenmore Some two. people might call Chronicles. it Glenmore Two. The Chronicles. Got a Chronicles um, got a subtitle. Which to help out. designed by probably the most underrated board game of all time, Matthias Kramer. Um, if you don't know his games, go check him out. Board Game Geek. Do a search. He makes some great games, and Glenmore was amazing. And it kind of like came out at that cusp of where. It was printed in English under Rio Grande, but only for a very small run, as I recall. And That's there's quite a, there's a little bit of language dependence in that game, so the tiles have text on them. But um, it implements one of the best, the, the, the best game mechanic of all time, the time track, which is the <laughs> one where if you're in the basically you could jump as far forward as you want. Um, and from what I've seen on this game, it looks like it just amps it up. So there's a lot of cool additions. And um, another cool uh, innovation in that game is that you're scoring yourself compared to the player in last place, right? So you don't jump so far ahead as like, oh, I scored a million points and this person only scored a few. You compare yourself like uh, it's a relative scoring. So you don't score as much as you, you know. I hadn't seen that in many games, so that was really cool. Anyway, check that out. Glenmore 2 Chronicles or Glenmore II. (laughs) I don't know if you can search for... So here's the thing. If you search for Glenmore 2, I don't know if it'll hit because it just says II. Anyway. Search for both, they might work. Search for Glenn Moore. Glenn Moore, which is two words. 
It's about whiskey making. <laughs> or no, scotch, right? I don't know. Is it scotch or whiskey? They're kind of the same. <laughs> well, that wraps up another episode of the Board Game Geek Show. We're glad, glad to be home and back in the studio. And uh, the next big show we're going to be at is BGG Spring. And I think everybody here is going to be there. Uh, so we're looking forward to that, and we'll see you there. And then after that is Origins and Gen Con and Essen and all that stuff. So uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We really appreciate your subscriptions and likes and thumbs and all that stuff. So we really thank you for that. And thank you to my co-hosts, Steph Hodge, Lincoln Dammers, W. Eric Martin, and Derek Porter. See Bye, you next everyone. Time. Bye.